Good morning, Phoenix, and welcome to the House of Mystery radio show. This is the place to come for true crime, conspiracy, and alternative history. Only on KFNX 1100 Independent Talk Radio. We're here every Saturday morning, 6 to 7 a.m., and I'm your host, Al Warren. back in the house of mystery today we're having a return guest um, uh, this time his new book is called failure of justice and uh, a brutal murder an obsessed cop six wrongful convictions and it's a true crime thriller um, by john ferrick and he's done lots of work on, on true crimes and and articles on the making of a murderer um, thanks for joining us on the show oh well, thanks for having me back al so, um, how did you get into this particular uh, case? Uh, these cases, I should say, and it's it's a different type of true crime book as well as you were talking about. So, um, talk about how you um, wrote this book. Yeah, um, well, this one's interesting too, to a degree. It's the first book that I've written so far where, as a journalist, I did not have any direct connection to the case. The other three books I'd written previously, I was either the lead reporter on or uh, or did some additional reporting at a later point in time. Um, so this was a case that, that I went into this uh, completely foreign and having no experience or extensive knowledge of the case. So, but it was a case that happened while I was out in Nebraska uh, covering the case um, that I wrote the book Bloody Lies on. Um, but uh, it, it was a real eye opener because uh, it was a nineteen it was a 1980s murder in a smaller community called Beatrice, Nebraska, which is in southeastern Nebraska, and it's about 40 miles from the state capital of Lincoln, where the University of Nebraska is located. And uh, it's a case that, that largely a lot of people around Nebraska. Had forgotten about uh, it was a it was a shocking murder, um, a sexual assault as well of an elderly uh, widow who lived in an apartment building, and uh, and within a few years of the case, um, the crime was seemingly solved um, by a by a sheriff's deputy um, who was able to secure uh, the arrests of uh, not just one or two people but uh, but a whopping six individuals uh, and. Uh, and, and like I said, that's 1989. Six people go away to prison for the crime, and then it's 20 years later uh, when uh, the Nebraska Attorney General holds a major, major press conference to announce that uh, that uh, um, there's going to be six exonerations here, and uh, and that the real um, perpetrator of this crime was somebody uh, other than than these six individuals. So it was an unbelievable case unbelievable story but it really never got um, incredible traction as far as uh, um, you know outrage or uh, um, or incredible uh, media coverage outside of the state of Nebraska and largely the regional uh, news media outlets and stuff uh, but it's a case that's well known across the wrongful conviction uh, uh, arena um, and the innocence project people uh, they're very familiar with it, so uh, so I really wanted to try to do my best, Al, to bring this story to national attention and get it the renewed uh, um, attention um, that uh, that frankly it, it deserves, and uh, and really um, give people an opportunity to see how a case, um, a disaster like this, could even happen. Now, what do you think the reason is for that? Like, why, for instance, the making of a murderer? 
compared to this like uh, this is six different people so why wouldn't this get the traction that something like that did um that's a that's a fair question the um the thing was about this case is that um it, it the, the crime itself had happened in the 1980s um it's four years later in 1989 when the case was thought to be solved 20 years go by and then this case was just kind of put out in front of the public. Um, but it's so it was a case that largely they were unfamiliar with to begin with, whereas in contrast with making a murder, at least with Stephen Avery's case, his wrongful conviction generated national attention when he was set free in 2003 um, and released from prison. So his case had already, like I said, gotten a fair amount of coverage, uh, and people around the country were already familiar with the name Stephen Avery before the Making a Murderer um, docuseries came out on Netflix in December. Um, contrast that again with, with Helen Wilson's murder um, and the names of the likes of Joseph White, Joanne Taylor, Thomas Winslow, James Dean, um, Debbie Sheldon, Kathy Gonzalez, but those are not household names or, or names that are very familiar with people, you know, to begin with. So, uh, um, so that may be part of it as well. The other thing is that the, this, this kind of happened in 2008 when the news came out about the exonerations. It really happened like a tornado that blitzed through Nebraska because this case was not on anybody's radar, including my own. Um, so it wasn't like the press was clamoring for you know, for the next uh, um, salacious detail or major, you know, um, turn of uh, events in, in this case. It happened very quickly, just within a matter of a couple months, um, from going from having six people convicted of the murder to just in a matter of months, all of a sudden being set free from prison, you know, and having their convictions uh, um, overturned and being given a full pardon uh, by the Nebraska governor and his uh his board of pardon. So that may have something to do with it, too. So what exactly happened here? So um, it was in 1985? Correct. Um, yeah, the, the original crime happened on one of the coldest nights of the year that winter of 1985. It was about seven degrees below zero, so it's frigid. Yeah. And, um, and, um, and Helen Wilson lived on the second floor of a three-story apartment building. Um, this apartment building was more prominent in the community. It used to be an old uh, telephone company building that had been renovated in, uh, you know, in recent years um, to, uh, to a three-level apartment building. But it was actually built in 1900. It's a, it's a very sturdy uh, brick building. And, uh, and Helen was a widow. Her husband died of a heart attack um, in the 1960s. Um, at a fairly young age, and uh, and she eventually settled in to this uh, this four unit uh, apartment uh, unit, and it worked out really well for her because she had her sister and brother in law had lived right next door to her. Um, but on on uh, on Wednesday, um, February sixth, uh, her sister goes to the door, you know, and uh, and that morning you know, looking for Helen, asking her to come to the door, you know, and, and she's met with silence. She uh, she goes and gets her spare key, you know, and walks through the um, the room, or through the apartment, and uh, and can't find her, can't see her. Um, and she had had um, eyesight issues at the time, so she went and got her husband, and uh, and Helen Helen was found in the living room um, on, the flo on the floor there, on the carpet, uh, and... Uh, and she was um, she had been uh, uh, suffocated, and uh, and and one of her uh, scarves had been used to wrap around her face or her head, so her face was covered, and it was clear that she had been a victim of a sexual assault, brutal assault, as well. Al, well, was this like um, a bad neighborhood? Like, what was the crime rate in the area? How was it um, compared to uh, maybe another area? So, was this something that? was common there? Was there a lot of attacks and assaults? No, that's a good question to bring up. Um, um, no, the area actually is right along the edge of 
the downtown, of uh, which is basically uh, um, um, one of the main thoroughfares uh, um, through through Beatrice, um, which was kind of which is, is more commonly known as U.S. Highway 77. But uh, but but her apartment building is basically a block or so away from a lot of the retail stores, uh, um, you know, the sidewalks, uh, just to kind of walk the, the downtown. Um, and then right across the street, there's a church. Um, uh, the middle school, high school was uh, real close by. There was a park there. So uh, um, so by and large, this was a um, uh, relatively safe uh, um, area. And certainly this apartment building, which there was only about 10 different tenants that lived there, um, Many of them were elderly or retired. There was also a handful of uh, single ladies that were in their early 20s that uh, that were uh, um, living there as well. But uh, but by and large, yeah, this was considered a safe uh, um, um, complex. Uh, and to the point uh, of that, uh, back in those days too, um, this reminds me of my old, my late grandmother's apartment building too. But back then, um, um, there was no. Um, a security lock or buzzer that would allow you, that uh, that a visitor would have to buzz, you know, to get into the building. So so anybody off the street could just wander in and open up one of the you know uh, open up the door, you know, to get into the building and then literally just walk up or down, you know, any of the three levels of the building. And all the residents had their names on the mailboxes and then also on their door. So. Helen Wilson's um, apartment. Um, it said H. Wilson um, on the door of her uh, of her of her unit, and uh, and again, an intruder and an invader, um, somebody that was methodical, um, could certainly know ahead of time. You know, if they were scouting the area or, or trolling around the area, um, you know, they could know, you know, who lives where and so on and so forth. Uh, so. When when this when this happened, um, it, w- it was quite a surprise for everybody. Uh, is the how's the community? Is it really close? Is it a real large community? What's the sizing of it? Uh, Beatrice is uh, always kind of bounces around between twelve thousand and thirteen thousand residents, and it's pretty much been that way if you look at the census numbers all the way back to the fifties and sixties. It's a it's a relatively stable. Uh, community. Um, one of their major employers is the state. Uh, um, it's called the State uh, um, Developmental Resource Center, but it's a it's a 40 acre campus that uh, that uh, provides uh, long term care for for persons that have uh, profound uh, disabilities, including uh, mental retardation. So, uh, um, um, but uh, but by and large, yeah, it's a stable community. It does not have that many um, um, people uh, moving in and moving out. Um, a lot of people have lived there for generations, and um, and again, every few years or so, it's um, uncommon for Beatrice to, to um, uh, you know face a, a violent crime or a homicide. Uh, um, but uh, but nonetheless, it, it, it's regarded as a pretty safe community. Um, you know, stable police force, uh, uh, by and large, a you know pretty friendly uh, and courteous uh, community, and uh, and local law enforcement as well. I also so this crime was very, very shocking. You know, yeah, oh, oh, I imagine. I, I noticed that uh, you were saying, so they made a, the police did a pretty gallant effort. Um, they actually brought in an FBI profiler, pro, profiler as well? Correct, um, yeah. And, and what's interesting, too, about this case, and it's important to distinguish this for our listeners, is that, is that this, when this crime happened, it happened in the city of Beatrice. So, therefore, the city of Beatrice Police Department took control of the investigation, as makes perfect sense, because, again, this crime did not happen. If this crime had happened out in, in the rural country, out in the sticks, um, then it would have made sense for the Gage um, County Sheriff's Office, uh, the local sheriff, to take control of the case. But, uh, but in this case, the Beatrice Police Department took over the case. Um, they did a good job, from what I could tell and from what I've researched, as far as um, um, you know, acting professional and you know and handling things by the book, um, now, Grant, back in the 1980s, so um, it, there there weren't that many photographs taken in this case. But I was told that that was not that uncommon, you know, in the 80s or even before that. Uh, so you know, there's 
I, I think I'm aware of a, probably about a couple dozen photos that were taken at the crime scene. They, are, they actually found a state patrolman, a Nebraska state patrolman who was in the area, who actually happened to have a video camcorder. So they just kind of, you know, brought him in off the street, so to speak, you know, and had him, you know, walk around the apartment that morning, um, you know, with a with an um, with a video camera. So it's very, very, you know, um, ancient, you know, and antiquated compared to what people are are used to nowadays uh, in terms of video technology and even digi- digital photography. Um, but nonetheless, that's what they had to work with back in back in 1985. Right, and. Um, and again, the Beatrice Police Department did a good job. They were combing leads, you know, and uh, and when they brought in this FBI profiler, Pete uh, Klismet, um, he was fairly certain, uh, based on the scene, um, that this had to be the the actions of one uh, single individual, a lone individual, that uh, that uh, that was demented and uh, probably in his uh, early to mid twenties. Um, but somebody that h- hated women and probably despised either his own mother or a grandmother or some woman that was uh, that was a part of his life, and this was believed to be a, a rage uh, rage type of uh, crime. And murder wasn't necessarily his motive, but it just it turned out that way, um, 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 unfortunately. Well, how did we get to having six people convicted? Like, how did that? How did that happen? Um, so the first uh, the, the first four years of the case uh, from 1985, uh, actually, yeah, 85 through 18, 1988, the Beatrice Police Department was working diligently to try to figure out who all um, um, might be the obvious uh, culprit of this crime. And they went through dozens of people that looked to be uh, either good suspects or kind of on the periphery, um, original suspects, but uh, but it didn't matter. Wherever they went, um, they wound up, uh, you know, ruling the person out for some reason or another or had that person ruled out for them based on uh, on serology, um, you know, blood, uh, blood, blood type testing that was done, which was a common method back in those days, you know, before DNA. Um, you know, is what it is today. So uh, the Beatrice Police Department, for example, had thought that they had a really good suspect uh, um, within a matter of days of this case. And um, they went to Oklahoma and, uh, and pursued him, but, uh, but they were told by the laboratory out in Oklahoma that he did not match the blood type. So, uh, so they ruled him out as a suspect, you know, and uh, really never... Uh, that never made any strides or inroads on anybody else uh, ever since then. But uh, so anyway, so that's kind of a nutshell of the first four years of the case. Um, um, there was even a psychic involved too um, in 1988 uh, that the, the police department was so desperate that they reached out to a psychic in uh, Colorado and actually sent her some of the clothing, you know, and the jewelry of the murder victim um, in the hopes that maybe she would uh, pick up something that could help them uh, uh, find the killer. Um, but uh, it never happened. And 1989 is an interesting year because that's the year that Bert Searcy, who had been a former police officer with the Beatrice Police Department, it was that year that he, um, by now he's working as a sheriff's uh, deputy. Um, at the time this crime happened, he was, uh, he was a hog farmer in rural Nebraska, um, and he got wind of the case listening on the radio and then short, decided shortly after that that he was going to try to solve the case on his own free time, um, more or less to show up um, his, uh, his, his nemesis uh, at the Beatrice Police Department. So he came up with his own theory as far as uh, how this murder happened. Uh, he was convinced that it was a robbery, not a rape. Uh, as far as, I mean, the robbery was the motive, not rape or murder. And, uh, and he looked to a bunch of the towns, uh, uh, kind of downtrodden folks, uh, people that were disenfranchised or, you know, uh, um, um, troubled souls, whatever you want to call them. But, but he started looking at those people as prime suspects for this crime. And in 1989, he's able to convince his sheriff, a man by the name of Jerry DeWitt, who really doesn't have much experience or training when it comes to uh, homicide investigations. But Searcy was very persuasive, 
and convinces the sheriff uh, to let him take over the case. Now, keep in mind, it's a city of Beatrice case. It's not the Gage County Sheriff's Department's case. But the sheriff's um, um, viewpoint was, since the city of Beatrice was in the county of Gage, he should be able to take over or investigate any crimes that happened in the city of Beatrice. So that's what these guys did. So they took the case over from the city of Beatrice Police Department, and they started by arresting two people to get started. Um, one was a fellow a drifter that uh, had moved back to Alabama named Joseph White, and the other was a girl that uh, had moved back to North Carolina named uh, Ada Joanne Taylor. So how – I'm I'm just sort of um, – that's not a common sort of thing in a in a rape case, is it? Uh, as far as uh, as far as they have multiple uh, people involved or accused yeah. of a crime, yeah, having having yeah, absolutely multiple. not, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, that was one of the considerations that the FBI profiler had took into consideration when he made his uh, careful, you know, weighted analysis as far as this crime, and he he pointed out in great detail that he considered the possibility that there could be two people involved in this crime. Um, but he ruled that out based on the fact that Helen Wilson had a, a lot a lot of money in her apartment. She had a, over $1,000 in cash, plus some money market uh, certificates and some checks. And they were in easy-to-find places uh, in her bedroom. And uh, that's where she was initially attacked. So the FBI was, was, was 100% sure that if this was a robbery, type of crime or a burglary type of crime, clearly one of the two individuals, at least one of them, would have would have taken the time to um, rummage through the apartment uh, and search for money. In fact, that's another point. There was absolutely no sign at all in this case that, that the house or the apartment was ransacked um, or that somebody was rifling through um, any, any of the rooms within the house uh, looking for money. Um, the only little bit you know, of, uh, of consideration was that Helen's um, purse was in her kitchen and she had very little money to begin with. And, and on the floor next to her purse, there was found a ripped $5 bill and, and, uh, and her key, one of her keys. It was on a ring, but one of her keys, I, kept, I think it was for her apartment, but it was, it was kind of left on the floor um, by, the, by the perpetrator. And the police's belief was that the person that probably kind of rifled through her purse to, as, as just a really pathetic effort to try to throw the cops off to make it look like the guy was going through her purse or something like that. But uh, um, but but there was no there was really no evidence at all that robbery was uh, was the motive of this crime. Um, Helen was brutally uh, raped, you know, and uh, you know, and there were towels found around her hands uh, that were used as restraints, you know, and um, and and like I said. One of her um, her afghans, uh, one of her one of her winter scarves, had been bound and wrapped around her head um, at least two times, um, and uh, you know, and that played a role in, in suffocating her to death uh, during this attack. Wow. So, what led them to these six people exactly? As in, how do you get all six tied in together? Well, it starts with a with a. Uh, a very, very, very shaky um, um, hearsay story involving a, a high school girl whose name at the time was uh, was Lisa Poddendorf. Um, she becomes Lisa Brown, but uh, but uh, so I'll just call her Lisa Brown for for our interview. But uh, but Lisa had uh, had known Joanne Taylor, um, and the two did not get along at all with each other. In fact, one time Joanne Taylor had rolled up um, Lisa's arm inside of a car window uh, during a fight that the two of them had. So uh, so the two of them, there was no love lost between the two of them. And so shortly after this murder had happened, as you might expect in pretty much every small town, you know, the rumor mill starts going wild. You know, people are talking in the bars. It's a front-page story in the newspaper. You know, there's all kinds of rumors and finger-pointing as far as who's the, you know, who's the perpetrator who committed this crime. And Lisa Brown starts spreading stories around town that, that, that she had met with Joanne Taylor outside the high school the morning after this happened around 7.30 in the morning. 
and she claims that Joanne came up to her and, and showed her, turned around and showed her some scratch marks on her back, you know, and told her that, uh, you know, pointed across the street and said, look at all those police cars over there, you know, um, more or less that, that she and Joseph White had just committed a murder there the night before. And um, so that's, that's pretty much it as far as how Bert Searcy cuts comes up with his investigation, gets it started, is that he um, he takes Lisa Brown's statement um, at her word and does absolutely no, puts in no effort to verify the statement, whether it could be true or not. Um, and, and that becomes the focal point of his investigation, is taking Lisa Brown at her word that Joanne Taylor had confessed, you know, to this high school girl, um, um, there's about five or six year age difference between the two of them, but that she had supposedly confessed to one of her enemies, a bitter rival, that she had uh, committed a murder, you know, with Joseph White. And then a matter of weeks later, Joanne had moved uh, away, um, and so did Joe White. Now, keep in mind, and this is important too for your listeners, that Joe White and Joanne Taylor were transients to begin with. Um, Joanne had lived, she grew up in North Carolina. She lived in Texas, she lived in Louisiana, she lived in Florida, she lived in New York for a while. Um, She met Joe White out in Hollywood. Uh, He was trying to make it uh, in the pornography industry uh, as an adult uh, male model, and she was out there as a stripper uh, working at a bar. So, uh, So they met there in 1983 or so, and within a year or so, um, she convinced Joe White to come back to Beatrice, Nebraska with her um, because she had had one of her children taken away from her uh, by the social services folks, and she was she wanted to regain custody of the daughter. And Joe White, being a good guy, um, followed her back. Um, and and he, they both stayed in Beatrice for just a matter of months now. They left uh, within weeks of the um, Helen Wilson murder. But again, um, Deputy Bert Searcy, he thought the fact that they, they had skipped town surely had something to do with the murder, and he, he was convinced or convinced himself that they skipped town because they were trying to get away with the murder. So it starts with their arrest, and then it snowballs from two people to six people within a matter of weeks after that. Then, uh, yeah. Wow. So what were they all convicted of, and what sentences did they get? <laughs> well... Um, let's see, Joanne Taylor, um, Joanne Taylor and another individual named Tom Winslow, who was, who was a friend of Joe White, uh, as well. I think they had lived together, uh, for a little bit of time in Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh, both of them were convicted of, uh, of a second degree murder. Um, and there was a handful, again, that's how we get to these six people. There's a handful of these other individuals that get roped into this case just out of nowhere, um, and and they're shocked because, you know, they're pulled in this case four years after the fact. They don't know anything about it, but um, and their names are James Dean, um, um, Kathy Gonzalez, and Debbie Sheldon. And Debbie was the grandniece, the grandniece of the murder victim. Um, she was borderline um, 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 mentally... Uh, disabled. Um, she had gone to special ed uh, classes in high school, had no criminal history, you know, of any magnitude uh, uh, or consequence whatsoever, but she's very impressionable and very weak-willed. And she initially, you know, stated emphatically she had nothing to do with this crime, didn't know anything about it. Um, but years later, um, um, she, she, she caves under pressure and then comes, agrees with the theory that somehow that she had um, gone to the apartment with these other individuals and uh, knocked on the door, you know, and her grant, her, her aunt answered the door, and then these guys bull rushed her, you know, and attacked her. But uh, but what's amazing about Debbie Sheldon is that she's arrested in April of 89, and within two weeks she goes into court and, and pleads guilty to a lesser-included offense. She pleaded guilty to uh, to aiding and abetting and a second degree murder. So she's kind of the first domino to fall in the case. And, and then from that point forward, the prosecutor was able to make it uh, put, to apply pressure on these other individuals and their lawyers. And a lot of them um, 
all agreed to plead guilty in exchange for avoiding a death sentence, you know, and uh, and for a lesser included uh, um, uh, sentence than uh, than life in prison. But Joe White's the only one of the six that actually takes his chances and goes to trial. He was he couldn't believe it when 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 they came down to Alabama to our, um, to arrest him for the murder. Um, and he was emphatic that he had not, absolutely nothing to do with it, and he was struggling to try to figure out who they were even talking about. Um, and uh, he goes to trial. Um, he testifies in his own defense at the trial. It goes very badly for him, um, and the jury finds him uh, him guilty as well. Then now, so how how did it lead up to where they were they were they were found innocent? Basically, it was proved that they didn't do it. What what? What made the um, whoever it was that uh, decided to go after this and find out it wasn't true? Well, Joe White was kind of the ringleader because he's in prison now. He was the judge could have given him a death sentence or life in prison, and the judge in his case decided that, that to give him life in prison because the other co-defendants had all been given a lesser. Uh, lesser included uh, sentence than uh, than the death sentence. So uh, so Joe White is sent to prison um, in uh, 1990, uh, life sentence. Um, and and he's tra- he's he's trying to raise money and come you know save as much money as he can from his prison jobs, so he can hire a competent uh, and proficient uh, lawyer to take up his case to to try to come up with some evidence, some way to prove that Joe is innocent. And in this case, there was a substantial amount of physical evidence, um, 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 blood and semen, that were found at the crime scene and um, that had been preserved for all these years. So Joe White uh, was able to petition uh, his lawyer, uh, who he hired, a really good lawyer out of um, Norfolk, Nebraska, named Doug Stratton, but, but they were able to petition the court um, under the uh, under for for testing for for uh, for advanced uh, DNA testing to determine whether or not the evidence that was found at the crime scene, you know, matched the DNA of Joe White, and that also happens with Tom Winslow as well. Um, he hires uh, um, I shouldn't say he hires the court appoints a public defender named Jerry Susie um, to uh, to uh, represent him as well. So so Jerry Susie and Doug Stratton, the two uh, lawyers. They kind of work together on this, and uh, and they file similar petitions with the court, just asking the court for a chance. All they're doing is begging for a chance to allow for DNA testing in the, in this case. And initially, initially a local judge had uh, rejected that, um, so they really were uh, had to wait another couple years or so. And finally, the Nebraska Supreme Court um, reversed the lower court's ruling and uh, decided that uh, no. Um, these two individuals do deserve, they do qualify for an opportunity to have uh, DNA testing done to see whether or not the physical evidence that was found at the crime scene really does match up with them or not. And it's going to be because of the DNA testing um, that's going to um, determine once and for all that none of this evidence matches up with Joe White, Tom Winslow, or any of the other four individuals as well that had all been sent to prison back in uh, 1990, you know, for this uh, for this heinous uh, right murder of this elderly widow. So, um, how how does this speak about the um, the justice system and all? Because what was Nebraska at that time? Uh, the uh, death sentence or electric chair? What did they do for for murder cases? Um, I'm trying to remember. At that point in time, I believe they still had the electric chair. Um, they eventually <laughs> switched over to a uh, lethal injection, but uh, that was kind of a catastrophe, and, uh, and I don't think they ever carried out a lethal injection during the nine plus years that I was there. Um, and um, and a year or so ago, Nebraska's legislature um, voted to abolish the death penalty altogether, uh, which is. Um, Kind of, which is kind of the direction that a lot of states around the country have gone, as, you pro- as your listeners probably are aware. Um, but um, not surprisingly, given Nebraska, um, a lot of citizens uh, were um, were outraged by this, uh, and uh, and they they got they garnered enough signatures 
on a petition drive. So it's actually going to be on the ballot this November, uh, um, along with the, you know, you know, vote for president this year. But, uh, but people in Nebraska will have to vote whether or not they want to have, uh, the death penalty, um, uh, reinstituted, uh, in Nebraska. So it'll be interesting. But yeah, again, at the time that this was all going on, though, the electric chair was the, uh, was the, um, method of, uh, capital punishment, uh, in Nebraska. And, uh, and, and, and a lot of these false confessions and wrongful conviction cases, Al, um, you see, uh, situations like this where somebody that's, that's, uh, um, borderline IQ as far as the 70 or so, um, they've, they've had, uh, psychological problems, delusional behavior, schizophrenia, all kinds of ailments. But, but these people are very susceptible, you know, to plead, you know, professing guilt you know, to a crime and not getting the facts right. Now, what happens here is Joanne Taylor, for example, she goes along with the theory that she somehow was involved in this murder, you know, from the moment she's arrested for this crime four years after the fact. But she comes up with this loony story, you know, that somehow she envisioned going to a house, you know, and with her and Joe White, and they went to ask some lady for a glass of iced tea. You know, they were going there to trim her trees. I mean, that's her initial statement. Um, it has nothing to do with the, you know, the facts of this crime. This happened in a three-story apartment building in the middle of winter. Um, but by the time she, go, by the time Joe White's trial happens, the cop, um, the lead investigator, you know, and the sheriff, they show her a video of the crime scene, and they do this with the other co-defendants. So I mean, just think of your favorite movie and how often you know George Clooney or Sean Penn, you know, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse before they actually you know, film the movie and they look brilliant and they win their Oscars. But that's kind of how this thing played out when it went to court for Joe White's trial is that all these co-defendants had been coached, you know, and watched the crime scene video and they knew what to say in court. So it appears to the jury, you know, and everybody that's in the courtroom, this is authentic. But in reality, these people, you know, have just been manipulated, you know, into giving these false stories, uh, um, you know, and that plays a role in Joe White's wrongful conviction. So, uh, why do people do these false confessions? Like, why is there? Why does it seems to happen a lot, or it certainly gets brought to the attention of media? Uh, I've noticed watching a lot of different cases where there are uh, people uh, confessed. Like, look at the big one in Seattle a while ago. That girl that was in Italy. Oh yeah, right, you know, right. Like, uh, like yeah, why do case. you know? Because I mean, yeah. sure, sometimes you're. Maybe you've only got a 70 IQ and you can be tricked into it or you're young. Yeah. But what about her? I mean, yeah. she was a university student and um, pretty pretty hip happening person. Yeah. I mean, it, it just goes to show you, too, that, uh, yeah, that false confessions can happen uh, under any circumstances. Uh, um, and and sometimes in the heat of the moment, too, the, the, the person that's in the room, you know, I mean, I could remember in, in the case like, wrote about my first book, Bloody Lies. In that case, Matt Livers, who was the murder victim's nephew, I mean, he was doing everything he could to cooperate with the police, you know, thinking that uh, that, that was what he needed to do. He didn't ask for a lawyer. You know, he, he did everything he could to meet with them, to give them DNA, to give them hair samples, you know, because he was thinking that the only way to get out of this thing was, uh, or, I mean, to prove his innocence was to cooperate. You know, and finally, they tell me he the polygraph exam you know, which is dubious. Uh, I, I doubt he really did, but but it was kind of scripted. So they come, these other, these two lead investigators come back in the room and start screaming at him, using all kinds of profanity, you know, and, and he's in a room without a window in it, you know, and he's intimidated, you know, and thinks the only way he could get to go home that night, you know, is by confessing and going along with their theory of the murder, you know, and people like us, we all realize if you go along with a, uh, you know, a taped statement where you're confessing to a murder, you know, you're not going to get to go home that night. You're, you're going to get an orange, you know, jumpsuit to, to wear, you know, uh, yeah, that night and possibly for the rest of your life. Uh, so uh, it's just, it's one of those things. And, and, and one of the investigators that plays a key role in this case in actually uncovering the truth, and she's a police officer in Nebraska named Tina Bath. Um, she kind of came up with, a, you know, with kind of different... Uh, you know, different with a different motto. You know, kind of a different theme as far as to uh, to use as a, her guide as an investigator. And one of those things is that a confession, you know, without evidence, 
meaning verification, is totally worthless. So it doesn't do any good for, for you or I or anybody else or, or to have a confession from one of us if it does not match, you know, what the facts of the crime were. So, uh, but too often in a lot of these cases, um, um, somebody will, quote, confess to a crime or give an incriminating statement or basically be coached by the cop, the lead detective, as far as what that detective believes the crime, you know, how the crime happened or what uh, that detective's theory is as far as the evidence. And... And it really strays very far from the facts of the case. And here's a perfect example, if I could mention this. Um, in Joe White's trial throughout this case, Bert Searcy and the prosecutor, Dick Smith, had, had, had went to court, you know, and the trial was based on some theory, some goofy theory that Helen White, I'm sorry, Helen Winslow, was suffocated to death with a couch pillow. The crime scene photos show there was no couch pillow at all used in this crime. As I mentioned earlier, you know, she was uh, she she died from suffocation because this afghan was wrapped around her her head and it basically smothered her. She couldn't breathe and she was already suffering from pneumonia at the time, unbeknownst to her and her family. Um, but nonetheless, the prosecutor, you know, pillow, pillow, pillow is the you know is, is the theme of the trial. That's what he gets these witnesses to say, and and. That's 180 degrees, you know, from what the reality of this crime was. So, I mean, that, those are just little examples, you know, of how a false confession, you know, um, um, can happen. So, now, you now you, writing this book, it's kind of different than a traditional true crime story, and you being a true crime writer and being involved in all that. Um, what was your intention behind the book? Well, I, I wanted to make sure because this is, this is one thing that really bothers me a lot about wrongful conviction cases. And I was starting to see this even with the Bloody Lives book was that there still is a specter of guilt that follows a lot of these people around the rest of their life, even though they're a hundred percent innocent and they're proven innocent. Even a prosecutor, you know, uh, uh, will come forward in a lot of these cases. And in this case, with the after six, you had a full team a full team of some of Nebraska's best police officers that were put on this task force um, with the initial belief that they were going to just uh, um, um, determine that the Beatrice were involved in this crime, um, that maybe because of the DNA testing, maybe it wasn't Joe White or Tom Winslow, but it was James Dean, you know, or Kathy Gonzalez or one of the other six. And in reality, it led to a completely different perpetrator, um, you know, of this crime. So, uh, but nevertheless, in this Beatrice Six case, uh, there still is a, a contingent of people in uh, in that community, um, notably uh, the murder victim's family, that still insist that the Beatrice Six somehow, some way, had to be involved in this case. Even though the Nebraska Attorney General, I mean, who's a far right wing conservative, um, and the governor, far right wing conservative, um, these people stuck their necks out, you know, and made a very, very, you know unpopular decision against that community's will to say, sorry, folks, <laughs> the local prosecutor got it wrong. You know, the local sheriff's department got it wrong. These people are innocent and uh, had nothing to do with this crime. And as, as twisted as it is, you know, for, for, you know, for us to have to admit this, you know, these six people are in fact innocent in this crime. And the real perpetrator, you know, was a man that, uh, that uh, ultimately moved on and lived and actually died at a fairly young age in the, in the state of Oklahoma. So, uh, but that's the thing that, that I really hope with this book is that, is that um, people realize that, no, these people, the Beatrice Six, are 100% innocent, and, and this was a, a, a bad investigation that was done, you know, by one individual who really um, was, I mean, was never even a police officer at the time this crime happened, you know, and he was motivated by uh, his own... Uh, um, ego and self-satisfaction, you know, to solve this crime, which is noble, but he got it wrong. And he still, to this day, refuses to admit that he got anything wrong. And uh, and sadly, like I said, the victim's family, they always believed in this guy, so so they they can't uh, accept the fact of what everybody else has. You know, and that's it, the Beatrice Six are, are innocent and had nothing to do with this crime. So what do you think this is? Uh, is this just sort of a... Um, once once in a rare kind of episode, or is this kind of happening all over the country? Oh, I think it happens all over the country. I don't think it's 25 or 30% or 50% of the time, 
but uh, but I think it's in the you know between one and six percent, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, it uh, and the thing is that with DNA evidence now, see back twenty twenty five years ago, these kinds of cases wouldn't uh, be brought to the public's attention. We would never have this conversation right now, and and the extra six would still be convicted of this crime. But since science now is 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 often the arbiter as far as um, you know science and forensic evidence of really determining guilt um, and 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 excluding people for crimes whereas back in back when this crime happened in a lot of these cases around the country all it took was a good snitch or two you know and uh, and a couple other witnesses and again maybe a confession or, or a similar statement you know and you could easily send somebody away for for murder um, you know, or a rape or something like that. And that was, quote, good enough, you know, in the eyes of the justice system. Well, now that we have had so many advancements made, you know, in technology um, and certainly in, in the medical science arena, um, we can go back on a lot of these cases and determine whether or not, yeah, you know, was the, was the physical evidence, was the blood, the hair, you know, the semen, you know, in some of these crimes, does it, you know, does it link up with the, you know, with the perpetrator of the crime? And if it does, that's, you know, that's good. Then it proves that the police, you know, even in a, you know, uh, you know, in that era, you know, had gotten it right all along um, and they could be commended for that. But if it, if, but like in the Beatrice Six case here, the scientific evidence was well preserved, but it showed the opposite. Uh, it showed that absolutely none of the six were involved. And the thing is that that apartment was immaculate. There was really no sign of any struggle, you know, short of the victim being, um, um, brought into her living room, you know, where the, the sexual attack had occurred. So uh, um, um, the, the crime scene evidence never matched up with the, with the theory that somehow six people were involved. And the other thing, too, um, getting back to that point about multiple people, um, the FBI profiler, he points this out in my book, but, uh, but he said in all his years, you know, being a profiler and studying cases around the country, he'd never encountered a case where somehow six people, you know, were basically sitting around on a couch watching a rape occur, you know, for minutes upon minutes, you know, and, you know, it, it, that just never happens, uh, especially with women. Um, so the, the, the belief that somehow three women were going to be sitting around, you know, or hanging around this apartment watching an elderly woman, you know, being beaten, you know, and raped, um, that, that's just astounding and it never happens. Um, but yet, uh, in this case, uh, um, the prosecutor and the and the lead investigator were able to convince the jury jury that that's what happened, uh, but the physical evidence showed that's not the case. So, yeah, I didn't. It, I, it's the first thing that I kept on thinking. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It right. Do, it doesn't Especially sound. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't yeah. sound true. It didn't sound logical. So uh, there's something to it that doesn't work. And, and this was a small, small apartment to begin with. So somehow the thinking that these people. Six of them are somehow going to barge their way into this apartment, you know, late at night. And then, you know, the two guys are going to take their turns, you know, um, committing this violent, beastly act upon this, this, this frail woman, you know, while the others just kind of just hang out there, you know, and don't do anything. And then somehow they're all going to just be, be silent about it. They're just going to kind of all go on their way in life, you know, and just kind of zip their lips and never say anything to anybody. Yeah. You know, that's just even more unbelievable. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it starts with two being arrested, and then within a matter of weeks, it, it, it mushrooms from two to four, you know, to, to six very quickly. And again, these, these were not, um, none of these people were choir boys or choir girls and stuff like that. They had their share of issues in life. But by and large, none of them... Um, had been involved in any violent crime except for Tom Tom Winslow, um, because he was a he was a co-conspirator, you know, in a in a motel robbery that went really bad. But he was not the main perpetrator in that crime. But nonetheless, he was involved in it. But but my point is that that most of these people um, had had you know had petty criminal offenses or petty criminal histories. They were just trying to skate by in life, you know, and uh, and so they were not that sophisticated. You know, and really, you know, we're kind of uh, thrown for a loop when they're roped into this murder. 
you know, and they don't have the money to go out and hire, a, you know, a top-notch, you know, lawyer to defend them for these crimes, so. Yeah. Well, hopefully it gets people talking, and uh, have you had any um, feedback on the book yet and, and comments about that and about justice? Yeah, uh, I've been fortunate on that, Al, that, uh, you know, that, you know, there's a fair number of people that, uh, you know, that um, uh, have read some of my other books and, uh, you know, and are, you know, regular true crime readers that have, you know, gone online and, you know, read the book and, you know, posted the reviews. And, you know, and one I'm really proud of, it came in last week or so but from somebody, but she had mentioned in her review of the book, you know, that this was the third book of mine that she had read, and, and she said that, uh, you know, that she finds, you know, my, you know, my writing or, you know, whatever you want to say, you know, like like drinking a good, a good bottle of wine and stuff like that, so it gets better as time goes on. So I appreciate that. I, I always try to make every book, you know, I try to become more proficient or better at it than I, than I was at the previous book. So um, this is my longest book I've done so far. Um, it's longer than Bloody Lies or Dixie's Last Stand or Body of Proof, but um, but um, but nonetheless, it's an important story, and it was a little tricky, just from the standpoint that you got six, you know, six um, wrongfully convicted people, plus a murder victim, you know, plus the real perpetrator, you know, and then all these other key people in the case. So I know from talking to other authors and just other readers that one of the challenges for readers is you throw too many names at them in a book, and it just becomes overwhelming for them. So I tried really hard to take that into consideration as I wrote this book. You know, so when I write about somebody by name, I try to drill, you know, drill it in your head, so you know Debbie Sheldon is this person. You know, Kathy Gonzalez is the lady that lived, you know, above Helen Wilson. You know, just so you know and you can identify with these people. So they're not just names that are being thrown at you, you know, on different pages, you know, throughout the book then. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Are you still working on doing your um, your articles on the uh, Making a Murder case as well? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I still, uh, I usually write about one one article a week. Uh, it seems like some weeks more than others. Uh, some, you know, I'm doing other research on other cases as well. But, uh, but yes, um, it's the last five months or so I've been one of our lead reporters with the USA Today Network um, here in Wisconsin, and uh, which is where, you know, the case uh, uh, had happened um, in Manitowoc uh, County, Wisconsin. So, uh, so I had an article that came out late last week where I went through and analyzed uh, most of the, the crucial physical evidence that was found at the Avery Salvage Yard um, that uh, played a key role in the arrests of uh, Stephen Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, um, kind of outlined what the facts were, the day it was found, and then who who found the evidence. So, yeah, I'm still trying to find and still coming up with uh, um, fresh story angles, uh, you know, that uh, that will be relevant and, you know, wide interest uh, to people that uh, have taken an interest in that, uh, that Netflix case. Do you think they'll ever um, get uh, another trial? Um, that's a good question, and and I think we'll have a better idea around August 29th. And I say that because um, Avery, Steve Avery is the lawyer, uh, Kathy Zellner, out of the Chicagoland area. She just filed a motion last week <laughs> um, asking the court for another 90 days for her to file her appeal. So, um, in fact, she even tweeted out uh, last week on Twitter something to the effect of, uh, um, her, she, she made a statement saying that it took um, police, you know, 495 days, I believe, to frame Stephen Avery, uh, um, you know, for the, you know, for the murder. Again, that's her statement. Um, she said, you know, that she spent 145 days on it so far, you know, and, and she included something saying that Rome was not built in a day. So her point was she wanted her fans and followers to, you know, to be patient you know, realize that she still is trying to do a lot more research, you know, um, in, in hopes of either getting a new trial or just winning an, you know, outright exoneration uh, for Avery. And I think it goes without saying, but in order for that to happen, you know, the onus is really on her, you know, to to dig up or find, you know, an alternative suspect. So uh, um, it's one thing to say Stephen Avery is innocent, but, uh, but I think the real challenge for her is going to be, you know, um, 
offering substantive proof, you know, that somebody else got away with that crime. So how do people get a hold of you and if they want to contact you about a story or something? Oh, well, I'm reachable uh, um, here in Appleton, Wisconsin, again, with the USA Today Network. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, my coverage on the Avery case uh, or making murder, I'm reachable at, uh, at 920-993-7115. And then my email address is J. So J is in John. And then my last name, which is F. E-R-A-K, at Gannett, which is G-A-N-N-E-T-T, dot com. And if people are interested in just reaching out to me strictly on author um, you know, matters, uh, you know, my books, uh, you know, uh, um, comments or questions they have on my books, that kind of stuff, they can go to my website, uh, which is com or wildbluepress.com uh, as well, which is uh, the publisher of... Uh, of my last three books, including a uh, uh, failure of justice here. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, telling us about your new book. Well, thanks again for the opportunity. I'll, always a pleasure. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.